Welcome to the October 18th Jail and Zones call. So far, we have Jamie, Jan, Dave, and myself, Michael. Hopefully, others will trickle in. And uh, Jan, go ahead and share that brief news from Mark Johnson and company. Um, my patch uh, to restore the uh, our ability to run Beehive in a jail with the IPs and V4 and IPv6 stack. Uh, disabled has been accepted so this is possible again in 14 it was broken in 13.1 and .2 and 12.3 and 4 I think and yeah it's an unusual configuration but it allows running Beehive inside a jail without access to the host IP stack so it's an additional layer of um Defense in depth. And we thank you for that. In parallel, I'll try to find the link to the original yeah. issue. My tab's all closed. Thank you, Chrome. Anyhow, uh, Jamie, speaking of upcoming releases, do you need any help with uh, the notes? I posted a document with just some, some little things that might want to go into the change list. Release notes. Welcome, Dan. I did put in just a one sentence release note about the in, the include thing. I mean, I looked at release notes, and yeah, it looks like features of the level which that was generally merit a sentence. A sentence yeah. is all that's needed to get uh, the information across that there is. And that's true. Short and sweet. Tell it mentions them the man page. This thing exists, read the manual. Yep. Because otherwise people will not learn about it. Indeed. Would and would it be erased. appropriate to have that uh, GSOC project from Shivank? Sure. I'll leave Don't that see why not. Uh, which was, I'll, give, I'll just post the, I think this is the review. Boom. Anyway, so it's, I'll leave it to you if you want to do Chavonk's work. And I'll leave it at that. Anyway, um, other topics. Uh, it's a little orthogonal, so I, I'm happy to later talk about the OpenZFS Developer Summit that wrapped up yesterday. Uh, Jan, while talking, hey, at that event, I mentioned to your WireGuard RC script to Alan Jude. And he's like, well, you know, it might be good as a port because if we improve it along the way midstream, that's real easy in a port. True. Uh, no problem at all. I just wanted to make it available in base so that it's always available. Um, and you don't have to install any packages and it would just get updated with the next release and so on. But of course, it can be packaged as a port. As basically, it's a trivial port. Um, True. Maybe it would be smart to just plan for 14.0 to be with a port yeah. and aim for 14.1. Mm, yes. Just a thought. I'm, I'm just throwing ideas uh, out there. It's a good idea. Uh, I just hoped uh, when I was last working on it, I hoped to get it in for 14. I know that that window is, has closed, so a port is the best way to make it easily uh, accessible so that you don't have to curl pipe something. <laughs> Right, right, right. Block, uh, which, yeah. Well, we definitely want to exercise it, and maybe it will, you know, birth other things. So, uh, are there any ports developers within reach? I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, uh, you are. Messengers, uh, accounts of uh, at least two uh, ports committers at hand. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm I'm one. <laughs> oh, one. Well, you shouldn't admit, admit such things in public. Well, I, I think we've all known each other long enough for it not to be much of a secret now. <laughs> no, no, I, I know that it, the commit logs are public and all. It's just that, really, yeah, it can become annoying when people just DM you to bypass the queue. <laughs> yeah. Can I jump ahead? You, you can jump ahead. <laughs> see, see, <laughs> yes, that uh, becomes annoying, yeah. Cool. 
Uh, and I would also like to see a comparison of WireGuard, IPsec um, router so interfaces. So I have IPsec uh, and uh, Christ of uh, Provost's um, OpenVPN uh, mm. kernel data channel offloading. Just uh, VPN shoot out for layer free uh, VPNs in uh, FreeBSD 14. Probably good to basically go and split it up by a single threaded throughput and uh, just big systems. And Is that a few and many airflows. Broader issue. You know, just to find out where we stand performance wise. Oh, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Totally. Really just to take a, a look at the state of the art and what's Absolutely. available to users. And then basically. Is there any reason to bother with IPsec for performance reasons, or is either one fast enough? Because and what features lack, for example, WireGuard is of even right now is the easiest to deploy of all three, in my opinion, hmm. even without my RC.d script. But there may be things which OpenVPN or IPsec can do better when it comes to dynamic endpoint addresses and stuff like that. So, so yeah, just... Christoph's talk in Coimbra was pretty compelling with the hardware acceleration of OpenVPN. But yeah, but he... Uh, he... VPN win. <laughs> yes, or but the VPN. results weren't surprising. Mm. And he left out the comparison I would like to have seen, but that wasn't the one relevant to his... Um, Paycheck, so I understand why I didn't bother to put in the effort to get the annoying, most annoying protocol stack configured and benchmarked. I oh. totally understand that. Okay. Still okay. relevant. So but that's not to a... jails. Uh Jamie, do you have any news or questions for the group? Have no, you... nothing new. Cool. So I right. have um, a bit of code for my state tracking to report on, but it's not yet um, usable because, uh, yeah, I caught something annoying at the <laughs> weekend. So, yeah. Which strategy are you going with? Right now for the state tracking, I'm using a normal daemon process and sequential packet unix socket and i have the semantics i need for now i will revisit once it all works if i want to basically re change the transport layer to uh, netlink generic and move the server part into the a kernel module because that would allow the kernel to um, publish uh, state changes as well, which could be a way to basically an alternative multi-consumer capable way to express the things so far reported via DevCTL, but cool. potentially more extensible. But that's uh, the next step once this one is done. So. Uh, do you have any tarballs available for testing of your nifty I run it based? There's not much to, so my nifty what? Run it based uh, beehive contraption we talked about. But it's, yeah, let me just. Uh... Shoot me a link when you have a chance. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, you, you, but yeah, but that isn't jail related. Yeah. Cool. Off, Something off, else off. I put. It around with uh, what you can do with uh, jail includes. Oh, good. Yes. And the things I've noticed, even if it's too late to change now, is that it would be really useful to uh, have the current working directory as of the past time available, which is a problem because if you exec in a clean environment, you get the user home directory. And so you can't use relative paths anymore. So suddenly your configuration needs to know its absolute path. Uh, you can put that in a variable, but you suddenly have to put it in so that you can make it available 
to the exact hooks. And the other part is which we've already discussed here that it would be really nice to have a way to basically bulk export uh, jail.com variables to the hooks. In, I would just I'm like fine. to have a basically export, include, export, uh, exclude, just something just like uh, fn match uh, against the name and rewrite everything not allowed in a shell variable name, but allowed in a um, jail.com variable name, so dots uh, with an underscore. Just trans map them. Maybe make it possible to prefix them so that you can rule out any name collisions with special variables. But since at least the default convention is to just use lowercase and the most special names in the shell are up, all uppercase, that should also just not collide. For example, uppercase and lowercase path are different variables to the born shell. How about non-bulk exporting them? Say, just export this variable. Um, one way, really, yeah, you, and way which would work is to, um, so what I thought about what, and the syntax Antonic uh, suggested for it was just to use a uh, colon uh, equal uh, to have an exporting uh, assignment, but you also need that for the plus equals. And I would just uh, uh, concatenate multi-valued variables with a new line because that's the most common uh, semantic you want in a shell script to have something. And new line is the universal separator. So if you have a, want to append to some hook or something, just having the multiple assignments uh, be joined by new lines would just give you the expected semantics. And you can't do much better because of the stringly typed nature of shell. So yeah, the shorter syntax would be to have something like colon equals, which would be a normal assignment just that it exports the variable and name should be exported as well by default or you need a dedicated export statement and then you could just have a colon plus equal to uh, append to a variable and export it that would cover what i want so that you don't have to go back and basically assign a variable and then export it but the opportunity to basically just have Patterns with FN match or something else or rack access, I don't really mind anyway because you don't have to match very complex patterns, I expect. Um, you probably just want to exclude mostly, but yeah. announcing them by default would be a breaking change because it would pollute the environment. Yeah. Base users may not expect so that we can't do that, not retroactively for unless you, yeah, maybe you could do it if you just have a switch per jail or something. But there are a lot of ways we can approach this. I'm open to most of them, and basically, most of them would work for my use cases, but having to basically build up a variable containing the shell script to export all the variables is annoying because it's such, such repetitive work. And with the support to include stuff, it becomes a lot more common to have basically variables to be included and so on and bulk reused and maybe not everyone including them needs all of them. I wonder if we want to, uh, instead of putting them in the environment in the first place, have a way to get at least some things from the current jail. You know, that's jail parameters, not necessarily the same thing as variables, though. You know, uh, the parameters should be also available, and they need rewriting. So it's things like path and so on. 
Yeah. Uh, but I also want variables and parameters because I need both. For example, I need the path parameter, but I also want to have a canonical, uh, let's say, variable for the uh, data set back, uh, in my ZFS pool backing the jail so that I can create child data sets during the prepare hook or something. Does that seem reasonable uh, as a feature request? And uh, is that well defined enough so that it's possible to? It it's definitely something to explore. I I do worry about the uh, the bulk part of it and the uh, namespace pollution, the environment oh. pollution. Of course, uh, that's a valid uh, concern. That's just why uh, the the common way to uh, deal with namespace pollution in shell for environment variables is to prefix them. Yeah. Just prefix them with jail underscore or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's or a user configurable uh, or have a special uh, variable which is the prefix or something. And prefix or something. There are solutions for that. And if you d just leave it empty, uh, or you could have it per assignment. And can you reassign? Uh, no, you can't really reassign name, right? So you. No, I mean, you can set a variable that is equal to the name. No, you can't have variables with the same name as parameters. The jail on command uh, refuses those. I found that out by accident when I tried. Oh to well, yes, that's true. To dollar path, <laughs> because uh, I was just doing a regex rewrite of a jail conf snippet. So you can't have a, a variable named uh, exactly the same as a parameter and assigned to it. So we if. We either have to make the uh, parameters which are auto-assigned, uh, exported by default, or have a state uh, command to export them, like dot .export. So food for thought, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you for looking was, into that, Jan. I was... I was going to suggest the uh, the uh, Oberon modular and any any modular programmers here, which is you know you would put a, um, a what's the shift eight called an an asterisk. Uh, yeah, asterisk. Mm -hmm. Yes. You would put an asterisk after the variable, and it becomes quote unquote global, like exported rather. You know, it it it's a it's a very nice method. You know, and there was also like in the Oberon system, there was also like you would put a dash after a variable, and it would become exported but read only. I mean, I don't think we would need that unless we're extending jail.conf to be a complete programming language. But uh, yeah, I, I, that's a very nice way of having it. Having a, uh, well, a, a, a what do you call that? A um, uh, an asterisk. But uh, Jan, I think you found that there is a problem with that. I uh, know the only problem is that you need it for both operators for the assignment and the plus uh, assignment. So basically, for uh, because uh, jail.conf uh, supports multiple assignments either with replace the current value or add a new value. So basically, That's any variable yeah. or parameter, but not all parameters have meaningful values, but like exec.prepare, for example, all the, of these can be. Uh, either completely replaced inside a jail. So if you have something outside, you replace a value within the current scope, or you can just append to it using plus equals. And you would need a plus equals with uh, export and without as well. Mm. But that's totally possible. It's just uh, that there's no, no good symbol or operator I can think of which wouldn't look a bit strange. So just using colon equals for assignment, okay, that's uh, easy to read, but I don't know any, we could use something like star equals uh, for append and export. So, but 
at at some point you are just running through the uh, printable non alphabet non alphanumeric characters to find out what you can add and it looks at some exactly. point like line noise. But uh, and cluttering the syntax pocket isn't nice. Well, do you think about the approaches to report so back? The other thing I played around with is to uh, how to avoid um, uh, needing null FS or union FS and still getting to basically um, layer things using just the FS. And what I've found kind of works, but I have to check out the corner cases is to have your data set, let's say uh, tank slash jails, and then create a sub data set um, for mutable and immutable uh, data sets set with can mount equals uh, off and the mount point set to the same mount point as the jails data set, for example, slash jails. And then you can tell apart the mutable and the immutable parts, and they no longer the mutable parts are no longer descendant data sets of the mute, immutable parts. So the immutable, basically, if you unmount it, you can replace the immutable parts without having to do the song and dance routine I've been doing so far with renaming the whole tree of data sets and then building it up again. So you don't have to untangle it if it's never uh, combined into a parent-child relationship in Z among the ZFS data sets. Hmm. The and... other thing you do is turn one of them read-only on as well. Hmm? You can also toggle the ZFS read-only property on the data sets. Uh, the... Yes, but that's uh, not a problem for me. Toggling the read-write isn't the problem. I want, let's say, uh, there's a, like a few days ago, there's a patch for free, a FreeBSD based system. I want to just take my existing uh, auto, basically provision jails and just replace the base system uh, just by basically destroying the old read, unmodified read only clone and creating a new read only clone of the um, base system mounted together with uh, the mutable parts which contain the jail state. For example, slash etc or something or uh, var db my demon name or whatever. These would be then individual sub data set. Any uh, basically path components needed to have them derive the right mount point would just have to be created with uh, can mount equals off, which isn't inherited, so that works out. And then an auto mounting would just mount you the right file systems. I don't know if I want the file systems to be mounted by the jail pre-start and unmounted by the post-stop or not. We will find out what works best, if it's better to basically have a stop jail be unmounted so that it's easier to do the ZFS recursive operations, which fail if you have the mounted child data sets and stuff, or um, if it's better to have them available. Yeah. Cool. Uh, keep us posted on that. I am definitely interested in such a thing, as I'm sure others are. Uh, very briefly, Antronig, is there any truth to the rumor that you might want to pursue mentorship to become a committer? Well, this is not the first time that I've uh, kind of slash uh, uh, opened this topic in, in, in the IRCs. And the main problem is not like me personally, but rather say you have, um, give me some generic name. You have Jack from Jacksonville who is interested in joining FreeBSD. Uh, and becoming a contributor, there are no steps on the workflow. 
um and that mm. this has been a an, an, an issue and I, I understand that like for from the senior developers point of view like everyone has their own personal workflow understandable but you know how we have like vim tutor to learn vim we need something like freebsd tutor on like how to work with freebsd obviously there are the books such as the freebsd internals oh, percent, uh, okay. Right. We also have <clears throat> the architecture handbook, which is kind of outdated uh, in the sense that I mean, there's nothing much in there that you can read uh, that will give you any idea on how on, on how to work. Uh, country tutor. Yes, country tutor is a very good idea. Um, I, I did start writing uh, in the wiki an article called, I think, development machine setup or something like that back in the day. Um, and, and that was going, I, I want to say, okay. And we've also seen a couple of blog posts of people who are writing about setting up a development environment on the, uh, um, on the Apple Silicon Max, which is a very good development machine currently, especially if you add into the mix, something like Ocam BSD, but that is pretty much about building the world or like how to tell I don't want to you know, throw out names, but let's say JavaScript developers on what the hell NFS is, because they usually ask, hey, I have a VM and I have a you know, machine where my editor is. How do I work? So, you know, we're telling them, OK, you can use NFS export here. You can do that, that there, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this is the basics. But then you have the actual workflow. Like, let's say you found a bug in Bugzilla and now you want to fix that. How do you move forward from there? Even assuming that you know how to fix the code itself. Uh, what's the process with Fabricator? We have uh -huh. a Fabricator article on the wiki and it, it has most of the things, but not all of the things. For example, it has about submitting a diff, but not about diffing a diff, you know, sending a new revision, basically. Especially under Git. Um, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, especially under Git, it's, it's a bit different. Uh, we also don't have the other way around. So say someone did send the patch and I want to apply it to my source to test it, right? Yep. That syntax is also now different. And okay, let's say you did everything right. You sent everything correctly. Uh, what's next? Who do you ping? Uh, how do you tell people, can you have a look at this? We don't have a yep. uh, committer's workflow, so to say, right? Hmm. It's basically... In the committer's uh, guide yeah. doc? Is there a committer's something. guide doc? There is. There he is, yeah. and this is the kind of information that's missing from it. Yeah. <laughs> the other part is, oh, well. this is you, the, even what's there in the committer's guide doc assumes that you have commit access and a freebsd.org account. Exactly. And a decade or two of experience to go with it, and you're, you're fine. No, you're fine. You're fine. That's, <laughs> and the problem is basically if you want to contribute uh, with the, to get to the point where someone will force a commit bit on you, um, you have to have contributed successfully for a while. Mm -hmm. So uh, the tongue-in-cheek way to get a commit bit is to throw so many contributions at, at the committers that it's uh, less work for them to just give you a commit bit. And uh, that, of course, isn't really ideal and it isn't the official process, but yes, from some people... It, uh, I've talked. I mean, Jan, like Jan, I do understand the curse of a commit bit. That's not new. But the the problem here is not about having a commit bit or even wanting a commit bit. It's rather just about committing. So you have a you yeah. know Jack from Jacksonville. He found a bug. He wants to fix it. What to do next? That's kind of and mm -hmm. he's not he's not part of FreeBSD. You have to keep that in mind. Like we we know we know who to ping on IRC. Right. Uh, we know uh, who to ping via even email. But when you have someone who is absolutely new, their whole experience with open source has been something like GitHub, you know, pull request, etc., etc. So now they have to know the free BSD way of contributing. Uh, I understand also that the contributing isn't committing, but rather, you know, how do they just send any piece of code and make sure that it does arrive to the appropriate place? Yeah. So, um, and I mean, me and Michael, we have very, uh, uh, you know, high ideas regarding GitHub. Like there are, you know, what do you call that? Uh, pull requests there that have been sitting for a long time and no one's looking at them. So uh, clearly GitHub isn't working for the project 
Uh, but that's a new friction free approach that is miraculous and stuff. So okay, so you're talking yes. you're touching on a whole lot of broader topics. Are you yes. still considering finding a mentor and pursuing mentorship? Uh, yes, and I'm not looking for a commitment. I'm looking uh, to see how developers work and write a documentation. This is how developers work. Follow well, this guideline. We collectively can do that here and now. And in theory, with the people we know and through, in theory, GitHub, we can make pull requests. Mine only, mine only took five months, I believe it was, to get in. Uh, mm -hmm. So that said, but are you looking for a mentor? And dare we ask, like, say, the Daves of the world? And Dave, have you ever mentored anybody? Cutting the chase here. So I just said um, no, but I don't do kernel stuff. So um, that, that uh, yeah. I do ports. Oh, that's that's that, that's fine for me. Yeah, that's fine for me. I I I love ports. That's also nice. But I'm I'm mostly interested in, uh, I'm mostly interested yeah. personally. Mm -hmm. Interested in uh, a way to like open ba what do we call that bugzilla, and like go over everything that's what you know a low hanging fruit. Right. And fixing it because because again, Michael, I'm your uh, I'm I'm on your side that fifteen shouldn't be a features release. It should okay. be all about bug fixes. Okay, you're way uh, off topic from jails, but yes, these I know. are very so, important um, points. These uh, yes. are very, very important. And I will say uh, ports and docs are the great way to get your toe in the water. I mean, Alan Judah is yeah. a docs develop, you know, committer doing little things. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly he's like working on open ZFS. So, so there's that, so there's that. Uh, let's have that conversation, but uh, if anything, hey, everyone, yeah, we're concerned about this and we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. So I say we yes. move on for now. If, if, uh, if, I, uh, uh, my, 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 <laughs> I know, right? That's my only suggestion here would be if, if anyone here has ever committed, uh, contributed to FreeBSD, if you can publish your workflow, basically like these are the commands that I run. I use NFS, I use SMB, whatever that you use, what your mm -hmm. workflow looks like. I think I'm going to start asking all the contributors or the main contributors rather, like what's your workflow like to see what's the most uh, user-friendly way that Jack from Jacksonville can just, oh, I want to fix this on FreeBSD and get into it, right? So we can have a kind of a wiki article mm. uh, for everyone to just read and go with it, basically. Some so project this kind of had... Go ahead. Go ahead. I have an idea. Uh -oh. Yes. Friday night, Friday night Twitch sessions with the developers. Developers have a Friday night Twitch session? Twitch. No. It, it, yeah. Is it Twitch? Uh, Twitch. Is that was... a street where, where people stream what they're doing online? Steve Wills was it... doing that. And I know some projects have had kind of a show us your environment kind of battle stations type thing. So yeah, that's totally... Worth it. Uh, I, I can do that on yeah. Basically, yeah. you stream your screen and let people see what you're doing. Well, I could I, do I'm that. For, and, yeah. For doing a I few port that. commits, or there, there are port commits I need, port updates I need to do from time to time. I'd be more than willing to do that. I think Swills mm. is. Um, off project at the moment. Oh, okay. Well, but, but it's a good precedent. He was doing that pretty actively and uh Yep. That was an awesome idea. I will follow up with everyone there. And uh thank you, Michael, for the link. I didn't know that live.freebsd.org actually had Twitch in there. Yeah. Well yeah I know, right? Like <laughs> well, slash Twitch, what do you get? You get Oh, on the left. Yeah. So there is Christoph. Hey. Tom Jones. There you go. There are a few. Yes. Uh, let me update. I'll update the minutes here because that's cool. Note that. Perfect. Um, and I think it, I don't know if it was like just Linux developers, but there was something like, "Hey, just kind of tour tour your your office, your workflow, your battle station," and that's inspiring and comforting and concerning. So. Very good point. And Dan, I was going to segue to you. Do you have any topics for the day? ZFS copy blocks coming to FreeBSD 14. Copy Yay. blocks? Uh, uh, block cloning block or block something. Cloning. 
but you may be able to cover that with your ZFS Developer Summit report. But I don't think that was a topic this time. This was from a year ago when PJD gave a talk on it. I just saw his talk. And um, it's coming to FreeBSD 14. And what that allows you to do, for example, is I have this 50 gigabyte file in this one file system, and I want to copy it over to this other file system. It's not copied, it's cloned. And it's such a fantastic idea. Basically, it's file system cloning on a block level and all the it's, advantages of that. It's, just, it's forking ah. for files. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the important there is also tying with Postgres. Postgres is doing work on this to use that function for using databases as a template so you can get an instant copy of a database. Oh, uh, cool. Using that feature. That's awesome. Yep. So I have a, a 300 gigabyte database that I need to give to someone for testing. Boom, there you go. It's it's <laughs> ready. Right like now. magic. Yeah. Right uh, now it's ready. And I see so much potential for making database migrations here. Yeah. Uh, and for, for a dumb dumb like me, what, what's the difference between this and uh, snapshot and clone? It crosses it's per file. Uh, and it crosses it's per uh, file. file. Oh. Yeah. So basically, so it's a system database. call to take a file and get a copy on write copy of it. So nice. both files okay. can change. We will diverge from there. And supposedly it has a lot less overhead than the existing duplication on the read yeah. and the write path. Yeah. And it does not penalize files which have not been uh, copied. This is, I think, very useful also for the scientific community where they have multiple terabytes of files and they don't know what the hell a ZFS snapshot is. You'll be like, oh, use this. And now this, it would be, yeah, this this is an amazing thing. Okay. Um, and it's coming to it, 14. Wow. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Antonik, uh, do you remember or just, uh, um, or more or less my uh, dump of an idea during the walk uh, at uh, your BSD con? I was just Michael there and I basically explained the idea of having something like a git for big files where you would basically check out a repository and then do this kind of clone, which has all been available on mm -hmm. macOS for a decade or so. Uh, basically do this and then you can give the user a shallow copy on write copy of the large files in the repository. And when you want to commit a file, you again, you don't have to duplicate it all. You just take a new copy, make store it into the current checkout and can then basically do an asynchronous upload to some centralized repository while the user can keep on adding in stuff to the local checkout. Hmm. And you don't have to keep a full copy of the file state. Basically, you at worst you would have to have at least basically uh, one copy uh, for the last state and so on. Just to keep uh, the and hacker the culture. current working copy. So this can be annoying if you have a small SSD and large files. Um. Would be great to add this functionality to Git Annex for the likes of this uh, audience. Um, <laughs> I think uh, on Linux, there uh, are other file systems with similar functionalities like ButterFS has supported this for a while and proclaimed to be also superior because we had one feature of FreeBSD uh, and <laughs> ZFS didn't offer. Uh, was, yeah. And macOS has had this for a long time and it's used inside of their APIs to enable uh, yeah. things like the file provider API. 
We need a mm. we need a utility we need a utility for this for users and we should call it zit, which should have a, a very horrible syntax <laughs> by tradition and then it should be in GPL two and then the open no, BSD people no. will create a BSD <laughs> version of that opens it, oh, it thought, you know and you know just just to keep the culture going yeah. <laughs> no nice. we should we shouldn't <laughs> don't wrestle with Hashtag the pig we will only pull you down in the mud and they like it. <laughs> Don't wrestle with the pig, yes. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Check out the audio recording for that one. So, uh, goodness. Uh, yeah, it's all true. So, yes. And from the conference, I think Mav was like, oh, I was just doing concatenating something or some simple operations. Like, oh, that was quick because it's just magic. Yep. So, uh, those use cases are definitely something to highlight moving forward. And when. We what need support. You do oh, Dan, everyone who really, whoever, everyone who really likes these should be writing blog posts about it on and about the time that 14 is getting ready to come out. Just, just, just mention it to get the word out there and put it on social media so that other people know, because I, I have no idea how I find out, uh, but I found out this week, something on Twitter. Hmm. Somebody replied to something unrelated. It sounds like there will be some rather unexpected benefits from this. And hey, Joshua, perhaps you have some observations if you've been following the block cloning. <laughs> or you're in the middle of something. So Wait a well, can you hear me now? Developers? We can hear you now. Hello yes. There. Okay. Hello. I was double muted. So double muted. Okay. Cool. So you mean my like my thoughts and opinions about it? Sure. Or experiences. Yeah. Um. There are obviously use cases where it's going to be super useful, but I don't think that like the average day to day customers I deal with are going to really care about that a whole lot. Usually it's situations where like they got a data set and they realize that they need to move to say an encrypted data set. So they, you know, they need to copy who knows how many terabytes of data. But um, going from unencrypted to encrypted, I don't know how you're going to clone those blocks because obviously as soon as you choose to encrypt it, the cloning is kind of out of the question. Now you've got to read the data to encrypt it. Um, um, but I mean, there are, there are other kind of edge cases. Someone has a data set and they decide that they want to get rid of the data set and instead, you know, merge like five data sets into one new bigger data set for whatever reason. Um, but like for day to day, like my server, I've had ZFS for more than 10 years. I'd have used it twice if it had existed back then, but I will admit when you use it, it, like if you need it, especially if you've got tons and tons of terabytes, that's going to really be a big deal. Um, so the... it's kind of, it's not a big deal except for that small subset of users. And when they use it, it's a really big deal. It's like dedupe. It's magic. Yep. <laughs> no, the important part is that it becomes ever more useful the more tooling exists for it. For example, uh, Copying a Postgres database. A Postgres database normally is a handful of files, but some of them are very large. Mm -hmm. So the user doesn't even have to know, but they do care if copying a database means uh, copying uh, all the database files, doing a sequential read of what, however large your database is, or if it's uh, basically do a logarithmic number of metadata operations in basically no time. So things which could take minutes or hours, um, these days probably more like minutes for reasonable deployments, uh, suddenly take maybe okay. sub millisecond. Yeah. So that's really, it's a game changer in that it enables new workflows 
at the file level. Before that, you would have to have this copy on write center uh, functionality within your database. So it's, let's say you have something like an, an SQLite database. With that, you can basically fork this with, and if you have a application which uses an SQLite database as its uh, application format, you just basically duplicate the database and do something with it if you want to do something like save as the file and you don't have to have a versioned document database backend where you have to import and export files to instead the file system can suddenly do these things in a fraction of the time with even a perfectly optimized sequential block copy could be uh, so that's the important part yeah there there are two things that that I'd say give me some concerns that this feature, although it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, there are two things about it that kind of concern me. The mm -hmm. first is let's pretend that I've got a 300 terabyte file. Sure. And I go to, you know, copy it to another location. And I think, okay, I'm going to start this. I'm going to go home, and it's going to be done in the morning. Yep. Obviously, it's going to be done in like 10 seconds or, or less. less. He's going to see that, and he's going to question what's going on. Good point. Is my server broken? <laughs> you know, what happens? <laughs> my, uh, I know I didn't copy 300 terabytes in 10 seconds. <laughs> so the, a great problem. It will always have. be a special flag for normal commands like CP. This is not about having CP default to doing this. Hmm. Uh, so, I, we could I, slow I, it down for you. We could, you know, put it. No, no it's about preserving the existing behavior. Yeah, true. Um, so it's people like, who do ZFS and are people with this, link your well, files. Well, no. Hmm? But anyone who's like just a standard one of the mail server user is going to be asking themselves what's going on. And they might look in the destination, see the file is there, yep. and then start asking questions. Yeah, cool. yeah, but that's yeah. basically, uh, we can't have the nice thing because people will be surprised if the situation is improved. They're so we should just nice leave everything slow and painful because people are used to it. <laughs> what's your second concern? My second concern is there's going to be people that don't like that they don't have two copies. Which uh, even though it's, it's completely feature. safe, and the original copy at the first location, if you will, is effectively immutable from the second copy, I think there's going to be people that are still going to be concerned. And I think both of these really are solved with education. Right. But I think it's important that the education be out there so that when people have this problem, they aren't calling saying, I think my server's broken. I copied a 300 terabyte file in 10 seconds. And they may um, have been burned by clones, which can get kind of squirrely and promoting and all that. So I, I, I totally hear you. And you have similar concerns, for example, if you know that you need a copy of the file, uh, but you will basically then transform it in such a way that it's basically a new file then you don't you know that while it's uh, it saves you one pass it will permanently burden you by going through the uh, now useless uh, indirection through the new smaller deduplication table it can make sense to take a full copy of the file and then do the rest later and modify it in place and overwrite it again with something derived from the old content. So yeah. there are valid use cases. And as far as I know, no one wants this to become the default behavior of copying. It's just an opportunity you have to uh, to optimize, which you have to opt in. Oh, okay. I did not know that you have to opt into it. 
you have to explicitly invoke this feature. You can't, it's not that things just happen by default. And the risk of deduplication is true and well acknowledged by ZFS, for example. If you lose the dedup table, uh, your pool is uh, beyond uh, fucked. And so the, this can be a problem if you uh, only have a single drive that you now have this large data structure, which is basically a single point of failure. If you have an uh, unreadable read error here, you will not just lose the the blocks reference here, but you will basically lose it all, which is why ZFS bumps the copy counter, which is in addition to the rate redundancy for uh, blocks, which have been referenced uh, above a certain number of times so that these, I think there are two thresholds uh, in any, so uh, at a certain, num certain number of references to a deduplicated block, it gets written two times. And uh, I think there's even a threshold at which point it gets get stored three times in addition to the uh, ZDEF, uh, sorry, VDEF level redundancy. But uh, don't quote me on that because I'm not certain about which exactly the thresholds are just now, but there is some logic in there and it is documented somewhere. I guess I have a third uh, thought. I don't know if it's a concern per se, yep. but that it, my thought is: what about if you're doing shares over NFS or Samba? Can you yep. enable or disable this function? Uh, you can't access it, and the read path is always the same, so it doesn't. It's transparent. Yeah, I know Samba does allow server side copying if you enable it, and. On say true NAS, it is enabled by default, but so, yeah. But know. Zamba is more about on, as far as I know, these things in Zamba are on the share level, so you can use ZFS snapshots and then export them as volume shadow copies. Yep. I don't know if Windows has such a thing at the file level. Yes. Um, I think no. I've never heard of it, neither have I. Um. And is your point, would it bypass it when you actually want it, but the fact that you're over a, a, a sharing protocol, you lose the benefits? No, you don't. The benefit, you just can't basically instruct an NFS mount to do this kind of uh, deduplicating copy. Hmm. It's just the existing behavior. And if someone did it to the file beforehand, ZFS uh, will just interact with the um, NFS server like now everything's normal because at the virtual file system level, you don't see the difference. Hmm. Unless something really changed. And so it's just that ZFS knows that these two files, basically underneath these two inodes, reference the same blocks, but. That's the optimization. There are still two inodes. So to NFS or SMB, they just look like two files if you copy them and use this kind of block deduplication. It's, it's, that's how it was described a while ago at the talks where it was presented when it was still under development. So it really shouldn't cause these kind of user-facing issues Except if someone duplicates a large database and can't believe that it's so fast, but that's really, yeah, magic is possible uh, through math. I'll save it for the ZFS call in a few hours. We're a little off topic, which brings yeah. us back to, hey, Dave, are there any points of the desired feature spreadsheet you want to discuss? Um, not this week, no. Okay, mm -hmm. well, cool. So to, um, to whom it may only, concern. Then I don't know when the next meeting is. I joined the uh, Enterprise Working Group, mm -hmm. and I'll mention our stuff briefly there cool. the next time the meeting in my time zone. Yep. That's the 20th, I believe. Yeah, I'm probably cool. away or something. Oh, yeah. Yep. And I think uh, for the next two weeks or something like that, I'm not, I'm not here. One, two. Yeah, for the next two weeks, I'm away. So, 
can I ask a question? I Please, promise no, it's not really to say, Antony. Yeah, and other points, totally. Go ahead. Um, I'm, uh, we've had a couple of contributors send man pages for Jailer which got me thinking, I know that Mandoc is the standard, but like, is there a way to kind of like do markdown to Mandoc thing where I, mean, I, I understand Mandoc's importance also historically, but learning things like .aa and .nn and what they mean is kind of, uh, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a documenter. I love documenting, but I'm not a documenter. So if anyone has any thoughts, please, if not, it's fine. Um, I just don't want to spend hours learning that instead of actually writing the documentation. And so Chris Stubbs was pretty clear on manpages.bsdlv. Uh, yes, like, yeah, know, yeah. Really used, nope, Mandoc exists for a reason. It does it well, and <laughs> those acrobats yeah. will probably bite you in the behind. But, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a valid, valid so one topic. of the reasons to stick with the annoying old syntax is that it differs well. It differs well. That's also Diff a very well. good point. Hmm. It, it's also unbelievably unfriendly, and I would have done much more documentation many years ago if it had been easier. Um, not wrong. But hey, I'm not going to win that battle. Yeah. I agree on that. I absolutely agree on yeah. that. It's, it's it, I mean, if we're, when you're coming from a place like HTML or a markdown, but you know, a man dog is not as friendly as you would think. Although I do have to say it has some very good benefits, like you can grip things out out of it very easily because of its syntax. But okay, in that case, I will tell our engineers to stick to man dog and uh, not think of uh, shortcuts. Let's put it that way. There's always info. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> info got Don't some hate at the event. Door. Don't open oh. that door. <laughs> So there's that. Uh, okay. Anshanig, other jail topics? No, it's good. Uh, we will be releasing the new version of uh, Jailer uh, with with 14 as soon as 14 comes out. It's going to uh, use the dot .include feature. Uh, uh, some of you, whoever used it, we've been using a patched version of the jail RC, uh, the, the, the RCD jail. We've been using the patched version. Now we're just going to start using the dot .include because the dot .include solves all of our problems. Um, we've also added multiple data set support. So now you can have like a default data set and non-default data sets when creating stuff. Um, and we've also added a, a jailer file support. Uh, but the jailer file, while I know that a lot of the other, um, what do you call that, jail orchestrators like... Uh, uh, well, I forgot its name, uh, Bastille and AppJail and all of them, they followed the Docker syntax file format. We've been actually using a Dtrace syntax as a jailer file. It hmm. makes a lot more sense. You have like jailer column setup column uh, start and you have jailer column setup column post to start and you can do magic like that and you can have hooks inside of it, which 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 is a lot more friendlier uh, than than the jail than than the docker one which is like sequential you know it's like it's like doing pascal versus c in 1970 you know it's, it's like there's a major difference in the syntax mental, uh, mentality uh yes jan it's 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 awk like indeed yes and we do support ipv6 uh, we do support ipv6 ipv6 i mean in in the sense that you know it's just variables for us you can just you know set to whatever you want Right well, at the end of the day, jailer, unlike other schedulers, is just a jail.conf configuration manager. That's all it does. It just manages jail.conf files and the directories for you. So you don't need to do things manually. Um, is that the right yeah. link I have on Trinig? That is the right link. Uh, our team tends to, you know, push very late, like, you know, mm -hmm. every couple of months, but they oh, push okay. a lot. I'm, I've, I've been telling them to be a lot more open sourcey, <laughs> mm -hmm. push more often, basically. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll let them know to do that as well. Uh, and those are some links that I found while I was researching how other operating systems do their open source thingies. That's Ryan Zezeski. Mm -hmm. He has a very good video on uh, Illumos Day and how he fixed bugs in Illumos and became a contributor. And also uh, Illumos uh, has this thing called RTI, Request to Integrate, which is a very specific guideline on how to find the emails of the people that you need to send them, what to send them, 
uh, what to expect, you know, and stuff like that. And you would, you know, you would do your RTI, you would send that to your, and then you would follow up on their um, integration platform, which is, I think, whatever that they're using for their source repository. Garrett? Garrett? I don't know. Yes, there's like a piece of software that they use to manage all oh, of Garrett. that stuff. Yes, that's a thing. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I looked into it. It's very straightforward compared to ours. It's, it's, it's unified rather, like there is no eight opinions on how to do things. It's very unified and yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not an Illumos contributor, but I can read and see, oh, okay. So this is how I do things basically. Right. So that was very much fun. Um, I'll put that up with your sort of onboarding because that is yes. a thing. Yeah. Other topics. I would argue the later ZFS call is a little more appropriate for my report, but the uh, developer summit had 40 or so people, basically hmm, hardcore, but very kind people. And uh, the videos were handed to me by Matt Ahrens and I'll try to get those up shortly. Uh, it was a bit of a skeleton crew, but that's just fine. Everyone discussed what they discussed, and the uh, wiki has their project. So, for example, Matt Aaron's was was producing a proof of concept Rust based Zpool list, and uh, there was uh, gosh, Paul working on VDev rebalancing and all sorts of neat things. So, I don't know if those presentations were recorded, but uh, the introductions of them were. And I looked at native encryption and found one extremely simple massive bug, which is that the ZFS props manual page is not referenced in the other mentions of encryption. And it's really important to know the say flags for key format encryption and key location because it refers to them, but doesn't link there. So I'll throw in a pull request for that. Anyhow, it was a great event. Um, bizarre pumpkin -y color shirt and they did the big old uh, radio tower behind San Francisco as the shirt because they always have some landmark on the artwork anyway it was quite cool videos will be up and uh, I encourage you to attend that event if you can oh right and the the best worst part uh, they're looking for uh, organizational help and they would like to broaden into more user topics and uh with so with a handful of developers there was only one non-engineer there and that non-engineer got kind of stuck with perhaps that task so can you topics. tell us anything about the id map mount support uh, in linux uh, for open zfs because that sounds a lot like uh, the UMAP FS uh, FreeBSD no longer exposes uh, since FreeBSD 7. Was that a talk? It definitely came up and I don't know what notes I took, but yes, it was a thing. Let me look at the schedule. Yeah, and I, I it was, oh yeah, there there is, uh, a talk on the subject. So check that out. There will be a recording. I'm guessing you missed it live. And what was the crux of it? Yeah, that was cool, but hold for the talk. <laughs> I, I And I thought, okay, do we need that in FreeBSD? So that remains to be seen. But that link I just put in there, uh, oh, I'll... I'll make this uh, the talks. Anyway, uh, other topics, questions, concerns, funny jokes, puns. Well, if not, might have to call it. Please like and subscribe to our video. Thank you for watching for all this time. Share with your friends <laughs> yeah. if they are any BSD people and non-BSD people and show Linux people how cool we are. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice. Oh, nice. Nice.
what he said. <laughs> well, cool. Thanks, everyone. I'll okay. hang around a few minutes and uh, see you perhaps in a few hours at the ZFS discussion. Yeah.